First of all, I want to say thank you for tuning into this video. The book I'm going to be talking about right now is called The Alter Ego Effect. So this book, um, you're going to need to get a little bit creative. Maybe you get a little bit outside of your comfort zone. That's totally fine. If things seem a little bit weird, a little bit wonky, you're not sure about everything that's going on, that's okay. Keep reading, keep trying to apply the stuff that's talked about in this book. It's been used on multiple professional athletes, business people, husbands, wives, all that sort of stuff. They've used the alter ego effect to improve certain aspects of their life. So keep pushing through. It's going to work out in the long run. All right, on to the books that I have been reading in March. Um, as a reminder, I'll be putting all the books that I've been reading so far in the description below. You can go check them out there. Um, and if you are interested in any of them, read them because they've all been super good so far. I have nothing to complain about whatsoever. Um, they've all been super informative in their own different ways, right? I've been looking at a lot of different topics. Um, and as you've probably seen, um, so it's been really, really good. Um, I've got book number 10 here, which is the alter ego effect. Finally got to it. Took a while. Went on a financial roll the last little bit, but here is the alter ego effect by Todd Herman. So you kind of got to get creative with this one. It's kind of taking you back to um, some time, some imagination and maybe something when you were a little more childish. It takes you back and get it, gets your mind in that creative, creative zone. So it's super, super good. Um, it can help you anywhere in life. Um, he kind of talks about you get to choose though or start with, start with one area of your life that you want to improve on um, and then go from there. What is your phone booth moment? What he means by this is... Um, you're kind of changing from what he calls your ordinary world, which is the world that maybe you're in right now, and then moving into your extraordinary world, which happens when you activate your alter ego. Um, the phone booth moment is obviously when you change into your alter ego. So Clark Kent changed um, from Superman to Clark Kent in his phone booth. Um, but for in that Clark Kent example, he was Superman. Clark Kent was actually his alter ego. So that's a little bit confusing. Um, but that example I found a little bit confusing. You could have maybe used a better one, but that's getting a little really getting critical. But um, it's still a pretty good example to see that phone booth moment is where the switch happens. Um, and you can choose different alter egos, like I said, in tons of different areas. So if you're an athlete, maybe for your sport, if you want to be better at home as a husband or a wife or a son, daughter, whatever it is, um, then you would choose that. If you want to perform better at business, maybe you choose an alter ego that supports that. Chapter two, <clears throat> the origin of alter ego. So this actually goes way back. Um, he said that it goes back all the way to uh, Cicero, who talks about having a second self or a trusted friend. Um, it's also a really naturally occurring part of the human condition. Um, nobody invented this per se. It's always kind of been around. We've always talked about it, but it's actually there for a reason. Um, it's a really great way to protect yourself and you can use this um, trusted friend or this heroic self that he calls it um, to protect yourself, gain confidence and to achieve your goals. Chapter three. Um, so the power of the alter ego effect. Um, it's got a few really good things going for it. Um, first one is that we actually already do it. You maybe don't know that you're doing it, but um, you, as we go through this book, you'll probably um, maybe look back and see some times where you actually did utilize this. It allows you to see the multidimensional personal, that person that you are. Um, and you obviously have different roles, like I said, talk about maybe sport, work, or at home. Um, and it allows you to be intentional about who shows up in that specific situation. It also gets to the heart of why talented people can underperform. So his example here was of a tennis player who was really, really, really good in college. Um, but he felt like he was, if he struggled, he felt like he was failing as a human being. Um, because being a tennis player was his identity. So like, if he struggled in a tennis match, he felt like he was failing as a, um, as a human, which as we all know, isn't true, right? So if you are able to separate yourself in your everyday life from your athletic career in this example, then you are protected. If you fail as a tennis player, you have not failed as a person, right? So that's that protective mechanism that we're talking about. And your core self is waiting to be activated just by intention. So again, that's being um, intentional about how you're stepping onto your field of play, he calls it. So 
um, your work field of play, your home life field of play, or your sport, like your actual field of play there. Next thing you talked about in chapter three was the four layers of influence um, that kind of surround your core self. So there are all these different layers um, that kind of create this one, this one thing. So um, layer one is your core driver. So what motivates you at a grander scale, it's something that motivates you or you want to work towards something that's bigger than yourself. We've talked about this in a lot of books, so that's a common theme, like what gives you a deeper sense of purpose. Um, those are just some examples there, family, community, religion, nation, race, or maybe there's a cause that you are um, driven by. Um, level number two is the belief layer. So that is um, how you define yourself with the, wor with the world around you. Um, it's made up of all those different things. So your attitudes, your beliefs, your perceptions, experiences, expectations, tons of stuff going into that one. So that kind of is the all-encompassing belief layer. L layer three is the action layer. So this is how you would actually show up on the field of play. What types of skills, um, competencies, knowledge, and stuff like that do you need at this level? And then how you behave and act and react and all that sort of stuff. Layer number four, finally, is the field of play. So which area do you want to work on, like I said before? Um, and then this is the actual spot where things are truly, truly happening. Chapter four. So this is your, talking about your ordinary world. I mentioned that at the beginning a little bit. It's where you kind of feel a little bit trapped. There's maybe a lot of frustration, stress, um, self-doubt, all that sort of stuff is kind of weighing on you. The enemy wants to keep you here. So your ordinary world is maybe where you feel like you are in everyday life. Shouldn't say everyday life, but it's what's happening when you kind of feel like not everything's going the way you want it to go, maybe. So that's what you talked about. The enemy is keeping you there, um, and there's a lot of things going on. Um, he suggests starting on just one field of play to start with. So I mentioned a bunch of different areas that you could work on. If you read this book and for the rest of this video, I want you to think about just one area that you would want to maybe create an alter ego for. Chapter five talks about moments of impact. So this is basically those moments where you are going to switch from your ordinary world into your extraordinary world. So this is where maybe you feel, like I said, that self-doubt, that frustration. This is where you're most vulnerable, but it's also where you can have um, the greatest impact. So if you imagine um, you say you're about to make a huge business deal, but every time you get up to it, you have a lot of self-doubt and then the deal ends up falling through or it doesn't happen. But if that's a huge moment of impact, right? Let's say you engage your alter ego, you get to that same point, you don't feel that self-doubt, the person about to buy from you or whatever doesn't feel that same self-doubt that you have, and then you're able to push through and make that deal. That is a huge moment of impact and potentially life-changing for you and the person if the service that you have is really going to help that person and you truly believe it, um, then that's going to be big for both parties, right? So that's kind of what moments of impact are, moments of impact are. All right, chapter six is the hidden forces of the enemy. So this is what is going on in your head. We usually can't see this stuff unless you start acting openly about what's going on inside your head. Um, but it's that inner conflict, and this has been portrayed a lot of different ways in a lot of different shows. Some place, uh, one, I forget which show we talked about, called it The Shadow, or an author refers to it as The Shadow. Um, the Dark Side, if you're a Star Wars fan, um, that's where this comes up there. Um, but it's a natural part of who we are. It's not going anywhere. It's got to be there. So while it is a part of you, it is not who you are, right? But it does try to prevent you from doing what you truly want. So we need to somehow overcome that because if, like I talked about with the moments of impact, those are huge. This part of you wants to steal those away and keep you in your ordinary world because your ordinary world is comfortable. Your ordinary world feels safe. It doesn't want you to reach out and reach for new things. But if we want to grow and we want to become a better version of ourselves, then we do need to break through this. So some of the common forces that um, might show up from your enemy are not controlling your emotions, lack of self-confidence, worrying about what others think of you, 
doubting your abilities, not being intentional, and having a bad attitude. Those were just some examples there. All right, chapter seven is about being able to pull that enemy out from the shadows. So we said last time it kind of lurks there. How do we bring it out? So in order to do that, we need to make the invisible seem kind of more visible, right? So we do that by acknowledging it, giving it a name, and then giving it like an identity that we can actually talk back to. So quite often the scariest things are the things that we can't see, right? You know, all those movies where maybe something's hiding in the shadows, but you can't see what it is. And it's like got all that suspense and makes it super scary. Um, what this does, giving it a name, um, is going to bring it out and then give you something to defeat. There's something physical there that your alter ego can now use to go talk back to. And we'll talk about it later, but like kick it to the curb, tell it to get out of there. Chapter number eight is the power of your personal story. So stories, we hear them all the time. Um, we think in stories from, I don't know, however long ago, if people told stories, or stories have been passed down from generation to generation, right? Like Trojan Horse is still a story. Um, there's so many older stories that are out there. Um, but what's super important is that we are telling ourselves the right things. And this is where your alter ego actually comes into play. Chapter number nine. So we're choosing our extraordinary world. Um, you get to choose how you enter it or what your alter ego is. This is the place that you enter with your alter ego, your heroic self. Those are kind of synonymous with each other. But the great thing is that you get to choose exactly how you enter into that. So your characteristics, your mannerisms, all the attributes and features, everything about it, you get to decide what goes into it. This is where you get to use your imagination. So um, using that creative part of our mind is actually what has been shown to um, get rid of that negative self-talk and all the criticisms that our enemy likes to use. Chapter 10, the power of a mission. So if you know what you want to accomplish, then it's obviously a lot easier to imagine your alter ego because then you can think of what attributes and stuff that this um, alter ego would have and then you can move forward from there. Um, so think about it as it don't try to think about it as yourself think about the task that you want to accomplish and then imagine it as if someone else was going to do that and watch them like in your head imagine them going through it what would that person look like how would they talk how would they act what would others say about them so all that sort of stuff and then you take those attributes and you put them into your alter ego and then you'll be able to step into that alter ego a little bit later chapter number 11 so here we are defining our superpowers and crafting our name um, your name can be anything you want. This is where that creativity stuff comes in again, right? So it can be someone who is real from your past life, who you really um, value and you find was really in inspirational to you. Um, it can be someone who is completely made up. Um, someone from a story, like if you really like Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or something like that, you can choose a fictional character. Any animal, you can combine a name with an animal. You can combine a name with a mountain, an animal with a mountain, an animal with a river, like whatever you want. It can be absolutely anything. So then you start thinking about what physical, emotional, or mental attributes that thing or that person has. And it's super important that you strongly identify with it. So he uses a couple examples in the book, but whenever this animal or this person or something like that, whenever he mentioned that to their the individual, it kind of like it clicked. They were like, yes, this is what I, this is what my alter ego is. Um, and then from there, it's really important to try to breathe more life into it. So he talks about here is actually going out. And if it's a real person, re listen to their interviews, read their books, biographies, everything like that. Um, same thing for fictional characters, go get all the information you can on it. Pull up Wikipedia, do some research on um, on, a, on the animal, if it is an animal that you want. Um, and then find out whatever you can. And the beautiful thing is you don't have to use all of the features of that animal. Let's say you're going to use a dog, but you don't like how the hyperness that they get, but you like how kind and friendly they are to people, right? So you can choose that animal. You're saying, I'm taking this aspect from the dog. And then maybe you've got a name of a person who was um, super calm and whatever. And then you'd be like, okay, super nice and kind to people, but the calmness of this person. So you, then you can mash those together and call it, Ted the dog, whatever you want. Chapter 13 is what is your the heroic origin story? So every hero has a story about how they got their superpowers, where they started, um, 
what drives them right and what their purpose is. So again, comes back to having a purpose, having a mission, having an end goal in mind. Um, and that's what's going to help you create this heroic self, your alter ego, and give you a purpose and a mission to work towards. Chapter 14, um, we're talking about how we actually activate this alter ego or with a totem or artifact. So he always uses something small with his people. So we actually gave some people like a placebo pill that's actually got absolutely nothing in it. It's maybe got like some, a little bit of crushed up sugar from, or something like that. Um, what's his name? The Marshawn Lynch um, puts skittles in his mouth, right? To become, to enter beast mode. Um, so there's a ton of things like that. You can be a small article of clothing. Um, Clark Kent had glasses. Um, the author himself, Todd Herman, used glasses. Um, I've seen people take on and off elastic bands, bracelets. Um, but it's something that is going to, once you act, it's something that's going to activate your alter ego. So once you put it on, you're stepping into that extraordinary world and you are whatever you've named your alter ego. Then the next thing you can do is create a ritual. So um, once you've put it on or eaten that thing or moved that thing or whatever it is, some people had like a, a picture that was turned backwards and then as soon as they turned it around, then that changed. That was what activated their alter ego. So that's what I mean by moved. Um, that's when you become your heroic self, just like that. So then you've stepped into your extraordinary world. You now are that heroic self and you are going to be able to portray everything that that person or that thing um, exemplifies. Chapter 15, talking about um, delivering a ground punch. So there's always going to be times where there are some tests or big trials that right something that is testing you to the maximum. Um, happens in every hero story right it looks like they're not going to win and then oh my gosh they're able to overcome it somehow and deliver this huge like surge of energy or the ground punch um that just knocks the enemy out completely right so he talks about two different ways two different ways of delivering a ground punch first of all is curb kick so you can get pretty aggressive here and this is where giving your enemy a name and giving it an identity actually helps a lot because you're actually talking to something um you tell it to get out, get off. This is my court. This is, this is my office. This is my house, whatever, like tell it to get out. Um, that can, that's the kick it to the curb one. Second one is, um, your response proclamation. So there's going to be a time, maybe you've heard, had this happen in your head a bunch of times where something, or you get that feeling like, who do you think you are? You get like imposter syndrome almost. You're like, I'm not good enough for this or whatever. I, I shouldn't be here. I don't deserve to be here. All that sort of stuff. Um, so having a response proclamation is what your alter ego is going to say to the enemy when this happens. So having something written out or something in your head that you know is gonna you're gonna say when this question happens because it will get asked by your enemy. Um, having a strong comeback is crucial. Chapter sixteen, final chapter, is talking about giving your alter ego now a mission so now that you've created your alter ego you know what its traits are um, you know how to deliver that ground punch you know which field of play you're going to be stepping into now you can give your alter ego something to do so he starts it off with something super simple something that you like there's no risk involved whatsoever going to a coffee shop so talks about sitting down and ordering your favorite drink but as soon as you walk into that coffee shop walk talk, feel, act, order that coffee, order that drink, whatever your drink is, and act as if you are your alter ego. Then when you go sit down, again, maybe you're you're watching or you're reading or I don't know what you're doing in that coffee shop, but you order it and then you sit down and you do everything that your alter ego would do. Try to act like that. He also says you can go for a walk, something again that's completely harmless, um, and you can try to channel your alter ego from that perspective as well. So. With all these books, like I said before, in my last one, I'm going to try to start giving everyone things that they can start doing today immediately from these books because that's where the real action and the real improvement comes. If we just read all this stuff and then don't act on it, nothing's going to happen. So things that you can start doing today. If number one, like I said in the, earlier in the video, pick something, pick an area that you want to improve in. Um, number two then, how do you want to improve in that area? Because that is going to help you identify um, the kinds of traits and personality changes that maybe you want this your alter ego to take on. Um, then start thinking about who exemplifies those traits. Um, 
and or who or what it doesn't have to be a who necessarily. If you think you've got an idea, research it and then give yourself a little bit more knowledge and make sure that yes, that is a good fit. That does resonate with me. I really like that. Once you've got that, you can come up with a name for your alter ego um, and really give it some life, right? After that, find something to activate it. So this is number seven now. Give something to activate your alter ego. And then finally, go on that quest. So you could do all of this today. You could um, pick a name, find the traits, research it, um, find a totem, small totem or artifact, and maybe not go to a coffee shop right now, but you could definitely go out on a walk and walk as if you are your alter ego. Um, like I said, all the links to the books that I've been reading are going to be down below. This is book number 10. We'll be moving on to book number 11, and it'll be Eat That Frog by Brian Tracy. If you have read this one, super good. If not, it's a super good one for um, getting things done and yeah, making sure that we are as effective as we can with our time because we can't get time back. Have a good one, team.